It works now. <laughs> hey everyone, Matt Lanfer here with Primary and Secondary. This is Modcast number eighty-eight. Yeah, we're going to talk about. We're going to talk to Bill. We're going to talk about Bill. It's the Bill Show. Bill Blowers with Tap Rack, Tactical. He's a cop. Yeah. He does stuff. He does videos. He he's on the social medias. People like people like Bill. Yep. Um, some yep. people. Well, most people. You, you seem to be. <laughs> hey, and my dad's a fan of your videos. So. Well, I got luck then. Win. Yeah. It's a win. Um, my background's in law enforcement. Uh, clearly, social media is a, a big part of my life. Unfortunately. Uh, you know, I'm still doing that video gaming thing. It's kind of fun. We also have Lane here. Maybe. Was there that is. a was that a cue for me to talk? Yeah. Yeah, quick intro. So I'm Lane Kritzer, uh, retired law enforcement, just over two decades. And uh newly introduced into the firearms industry kind of guy. So that's kind of what I'm doing now. And enjoying every minute? Yes, of course. Yeah. I didn't know that, Lane. What, what are you, what are you, I mean, I knew obviously that you're a shooter and an instructor and that kind of stuff, but what, what, what specifically are you doing in the industry that's different? Oh, I'm sure we, we'll cover that on our date. This is, uh, okay. this is the bill hour, <laughs> four plus. It's the bill show. And Bill Blowers. Bill Blowers. How are you? I'm good, man. Good. Yeah, I'm doing. I'm doing good. I'm. Uh, yes. Uh, this. Uh, well, when did when did we talk about this? Like three months ago, four months ago. Oh, at least. Yeah. So, you know, and uh, who the hell wants to hear about me? Kind of a thing, and I'm still kind of wanted that, and so yeah, here we are. I I do. That's, oh, that's good. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. Lane does. Lane Lane checked in, so I Lane guess he wants. To, yeah. Lane is here. Um, basically, the gist behind this was to provide viewers a, a better idea about who's on these videos who, who's this bill blowers guy um yeah that's I, I i enjoy your videos i i i like how you're able to explain things um you're able to take some complex things and make them simple you're able to take some simple things and make other people feel very bad about them um <laughs> so to yeah, start that's, off, that's, yeah. that's my intent that's my intent so yeah i guess yeah. Mission success. And, and that's the best part also about the, the simple stuff. It's applicable to everyone. Even the most seasoned person, they can watch something and go, you know what, I, I need to work on that. Or oh, that's a good point. Or I, I could change something. Or it's just more information you can pass on to people that, that need it. That's what primary and secondary is about. Um, so you started off in the military. You were in the Army. Yeah. Why did you choose the Army? You know, and, not it's, the, uh, and not the Coast Guard. <laughs> so, well, the, the, the first answer for both the Navy and the Coast Guard is I swim like a gun safe, so it wasn't even an option. Um, but So I think a, a chunk of this man, my dad uh, was in the Army for 32 years, and I grew up on Army bases uh, all over the place, uh, born in Oklahoma, and then uh, we lived in Germany for a time, and then my dad uh, came out here to Washington to Fort Lewis. And uh, he was getting, I think we had been here, to, uh, whatever, two, three years, I'm yeah, never mind. I'm digressing. Anyway, he retired here. Uh, my parents said this is where they wanted to be, and uh, and so he got out after 32 years in the army. And uh, it's a. Uh, I will tell you that because of all of the army time, uh, growing up on army bases, watching him, he's always gone. Uh, combat arms guy. Uh, and, and I think I resisted it to some degree, even though in my heart, uh, I, in hindsight. Uh, I probably should have been one of those dudes that as a, a sophomore in high school, I was thinking about joining the military at that point. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, but kind of a jackass. And, and I kind of always bucked my dad. I was a little bit of a, a troublemaker as a, as a younger dude. Um, and so anyway, I, I graduated from high school and uh, uh, ended up going to a local community college for a quarter. Uh, completely screwed that up. Uh, spent my, all my time uh, hitting keggers and, and chasing ladies and that kind of a thing. And uh I remember going uh, at the completion of that, I had really, 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 really bad grades and uh, going to talk to my dad and, hey, man, I need another, you know, 20 bucks for tuition kind of a thing. And he's like, man, you're, you're stoned, dude. I'm not I'm not paying for any more of that junk. Um, if you're not taking it seriously, you're not going to do anything with it. So he kind of put the ultimatum on me. Um, I started working. Um, 
I was doing a bunch of different uh, crap. I, I, I built waterbed frames for a while. I uh, worked at the uh, the Nally Pickle Factory, which is a, a big, I don't know if you guys got Nally Pickles down there in Utah or not. But, don't even uh, know what that is. Yeah, it's just a, it's a local <laughs> manufacturer. I worked there for a bit, um, painted houses, did that kind of shit. And then uh, I ended up getting two uh, uh, speeding tickets almost back to back. Actually, one was speed and one was an illegal lane change. And I'm flat broke. I don't, I don't have a damn penny in my name. I'm blowing all my money on, on dumb shit. Um, and so I thought, well, I'm going to, you know, contest these things. At least if nothing else, it delays me having to pay them for a bit. Maybe I can go in and, and, uh, and you know, make a big excuse to the judge kind of shit. And uh, so I went up on the first one. I went to court, uh, said my piece. And, uh, I, you know, I, probably the way my dad raised me, I didn't try to bullshit the guy and say I wasn't speeding. Um uh, you know, essentially what I tried to convince him was that even though I was exceeding the posted speed limit based on my superior driving skill, it was as safe as somebody going the, the regular old speed limit. Right. So, um, you know, can you, can you hook a brother up kind of a thing? And, and the judge kind of shook his head at me. He's like full fine going on your record, basically get the hell out of here kind of a thing. And, and that I, wasn't a Pinto. No, I was, uh, so uh, for dudes that remember, man, it was a, a Dodge Colt, the little four banger Dodge Colt is my sister's car, which I had stolen when I was 14, put into a ditch. Um, but maybe that's the story for a different day. And I got caught cause I couldn't get the car out of the ditch. So spent the night in the car, uh, one of my bu <laughs> buddy's moms found me sleeping in the car and, uh, she took me home and my dad, uh, I thought he was going to stick a rake in my head, but anyway, so on the way back from traffic court, uh, I'm sitting, I, Hit, hit a red light and uh i'm sitting there waiting for the light to change and i looked to my right and it's army recruiter's office and so i literally i pulled in went walked right in said hey i want to join the hell up what do you got kind of a thing um took the uh the asvab test right there at the uh i think it was the asvab maybe it was a sa whatever the hell they call that test a fast test i don't remember what the hell it was called anyway took the test and uh the dude said here's the shit you qualify for i, I initially i, I thought I, I wanted to fly helicopters was the big deal um, for me. I it was thinking I wanted to be an aviator and I had scored high enough. Um, but he told me that you had to, at that point, you had to be in the army already. And then you could submit for flight school once you were in um, whether that's true. And I don't, I don't know. Um, so I said, okay, well, what about MP as a, you know, as a young dude, I always had wanted to be a copper. So I thought, well, maybe the MP thing. And then once I get out, that'll transition into uh you know, into a civilian cop job. And uh, he said, yeah, MP, you qualify for it. Uh, the, the next MP school is like eight months from that date. And I was like, okay, th let me let me refine this a little bit for you. What do you have in the next two weeks? And he said, well, I got this uh, really awesome job called 19 Delta. It's a scout. And look at this, you know, they have those big, uh, big ass CDs. You remember I'm talking about the big laser disc, whatever. Yeah. So he pops that shit in and uh, these sons of bitches are running around blowing up bridges and crap and, and doing all kinds of sweet shit. And I thought, man, that's a job for me. I want that job. And uh, so he signed me up. He took me to Seattle right there on the spot. Um, went through all the bullshit the next day. Uh, brought me back to my car, drove home. I didn't go home. My dad said, where you been? And I said, I've joined the Army. I, I leave in, I think at that point, it was 11 days. And he's like, are you kidding me? And I said, no. And he goes, you think after uh, 32 years in the Army, maybe I could have given you some advice on what you want to do? <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah. I said, what the hell do you know, right? I mean, shit. <laughs> I'm a pretty smart fella. And he goes, well, what'd you get? And I said, I got 19 Delta, all cool and shit. And he's like, the D stands for detailed dummy. All you're going to do is pick up garbage on the post. <laughs> and uh, he was pretty much right for my first year. So I did was wear a road guard rest and go pick up garbage around Fort Knox. So that's, that's kind of how I joined the army in hindsight. And I, it's funny because uh, I remember eating dinner. Um, and my dad was a big dad. We, we would be at dinner every night, the whole damn family. Right. Um, but I remember eating dinner and, uh, we were somehow the camera's about, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Kind of shit, right? Me and my brother, my, my sisters, and you know, you're, everybody's popping their shit off whatever they think they're going to end up doing. Uh, and I remember my dad saying, you're going to be an army ranger. And I, I, I remember thinking, get out of here. I'm not joining the army, man. That, that is not my gig. I, you know, I just F all that junk in hindsight. I wish I would have listened to the sum of gun because the, once I was in and I kind of had a better idea what the army was about and, and what it was doing for me on a personal level, um, you know, and still in the discipline. Um, I, I was fortunate with some good leaders. Um, I always thought, man, I, that I should have joined up uh, as a, as an army ranger and done that, uh, that job. And, and, you know, a lot of influential dudes in my life uh, have been army rangers. So I think that helps me think that as well. Um, so anyway, that's the yeah, end. That's what happened with the army. So I was at Fort Knox for two years. Went to Germany for two and then uh, re-enlisted, came to Fort Lewis 
And that was right. Uh, the first Gulf War was kicking off. And I remember our platoon started pulling us up and saying, hey, fellas, we're, we were desert warfare specialists over here, believe that or not, in Washington, because the east side is all desert. So we would go over to Yakima all the time and, and down to NTC. Uh, obviously, it's going to be a desert-based war. Um, but he pulled us all up and he said, hey, fellas, just so you know, uh, we're we're going. The, uh, we've got the word from... Um, you know, from the big boys and, and this war unit is definitely deploying. So I was like bitching, right, right, right on kind of thing. The only, um, the, the only thing that, that hit me that was, uh, I was excited to go. I was looking forward to the, uh, to see what would happen, that kind of a deal. Um, but I was like, man, I got, you know, my wife, uh, at that time I was married, I had a, my oldest son, I uh, had just been born. I think, you know, how am I going to let her know this, this bit of news? Uh, and so I didn't tell her I was going to wait until we actually got the final word on it. And then, as it turns out, we didn't deploy. We went down to NTC and we trained National Guard units for uh, multiple rotations, uh, trying to get those guys prepped up and getting them ready to go over there. So I never did deploy out of uh, out of the country during the first Gulf War. And of course, it was over and done with fairly quickly. So kind of interesting, though, uh, kind of kind of worked out for me. There were dudes that were um, because of the war and because of, you know, Saddam's uh, um, what the hell were they? The. Uh, his guard unit that was supposed to be some kick-ass unit, you know what I'm saying? Uh, there was an Republican expectation. Guard. Yeah, the Republican Guard. Um, it's supposed to be some kick-ass unit, you know, they could give us a real good fight and all this kind of shit. So they had uh, stopped a lot of guys that were that were due to get out. Uh, they did not let them um, get out of the Army because we're expecting to go to war kind of a thing. And uh, so once the war was over with, I was still on my second enlistment. But they had kept so many dudes, and I think there was there were dudes that – would have gotten out prior to being mandated to stay in and and now a year or two years later whatever the hell it was they were thinking well shit i'm i'm over the hump right i'm on the i'm, I'm closer to retire than i was so i'm going to stay in so they were really trying to knock the force back down uh and they came up with some shit and said hey if you if you're looking to get out of the army um you can essentially do a, a two-week notice like you would in any other job so you first aren't known and we'll out process you and, and get you cracking uh, for Lewis, I was more, you know, I'm from here. That's why I re-enlisted to come back to Lewis. Uh, my wife is from here. And so I thought, well, I'm going to start testing right now. So I started testing uh, different police departments while I was active duty. Uh, got offered a job uh, by a small police department. Um, and I, I remember, you know, I had my chief interview. And he's like, man, I want you to, you know, I want you to come be a cop here. And I said, well, how much time do I have? And he said, well, if you can, you know, if you can do two weeks and that's perfect, let's do that. So I went in, that was, I interviewed with him on a Sunday, went in the next Monday PT with the, uh, with the uh, platoon and then went and saw the first round and said, top him, well, I think I want to get out, man, I'm ready to get out. And uh, he said, okay. And uh, I was, I was the most efficient shit I'd ever seen the army do. I was out in two weeks, man. I had four, four days off and I was at the cop job. So pretty, pretty damn lucky as far as that goes. I didn't, I don't think I missed a paycheck. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That, that my time at Lewis, man, was, uh, so I think the, uh, a big thing, but the time I spent at Fort Knox was all op four. So that's where they do the, uh, they train all the armor officers there. So all the tank officers and shit, uh, come through Fort Knox. And so I was in a unit, uh, the 12 cav, uh, which was the op four for that. So we had fake T 72s, BMPs and that kind of shit. And we were, we were, you know, just got basically went, ran out ran around and, and tried to stomp them out and they tried to stomp us out. And for whatever reason, that unit, um, it was more about spit and polish. I mean, we wore these fake looking Russian uniforms and shit. And, uh, and you know, yeah, just I do, wasn't doing my job as a scout. That's that is for sure. Um, the good thing was we were I was learning even as a young dude, you know, when is in the E1, no, uh, no rank at all. Uh, but I learned uh, Russian doctrine because that's what we were supposed to be. So obviously at that time, Cold War is going on and uh so I, even the little bit that I picked up and I ended up getting promoted to corporal before I left that unit. Uh, so I was, I was running, a, I was in charge of a vehicle. And so kind of had to know uh, more than, you know, uh, an E2 kind of a deal. Um, and I, but it again, it wasn't doing my job. I remember I had a, a good section sergeant, a guy named Sergeant White. Um, and, and he recognized that we weren't doing our job. Uh, and I think he was also a guy that, you know, this this job is important. We, you know, we got to train these these new uh, armor officers to to go out and be ready to take over a tank platoon or whatever. Um, but we also have a duty to our young soldiers so that if they leave here or if war breaks out, that they are capable of doing the job they signed up to do. Uh, and so right before I left, maybe the, like the last four or five months, something like that, he was uh, we were doing when we weren't being up for he would make us go back to being American soldiers and uh, 
and taught us kind of how to do our job. So when I left there, I kind of had knew what I was doing, but to be honest with you, I was a paper corporal. I did, I should not have been a, I should not have gone to Germany as a corporal. That's for damn sure. Didn't know what the hell I was doing. So anyway, I went over there. Um, second, uh, ca second squadron, second armor cavalry regiment. Uh, we were, um, had a section of the, uh, of the border, um, between West and East Germany. Um, you know, kind of, I think there was, uh, again, it's cold war, right? Um, there was a, uh, I guess, a sense of urgency uh, because we were supposed to be the the speed bump for for the Russians coming through the gaps, um, and uh, the NCOs that were in the platoon that I got assigned to uh, took that task very seriously, uh, and I think we were, we were deployed to the border for forty five days, uh, four times a year. Uh, we had gunnery. I, I was assigned on Bradley's at that time, so we had gunnery to do. Um, you had your normal small arms shit. You had normal, uh, you know, scout tasks to do. Uh, we had reforger. I mean, all these larger field exercises that were going on, um, and, and just a really, really professional group of dudes. Uh, as far as junior NCOs that I was associated with, um, th th for whatever reason, took me under their wing and, and you know thought, man, this this kid is salvageable. Let's try and make him into a, a real NCO. Um, and they did, man. Uh, I owe a lot to dudes like a guy named Sergeant Jim Klein, um, who's now retired. Another dude, Sergeant John Serta. Uh, I'm friends with Serta on Facebook now. That's one of the nice things about Facebook. He was able to look me up. But those dudes really taught me how to be uh, good at my job and to take it serious. And, uh, you know, I, I guess to be what a sergeant should be and, and try to, you know, live up to the expectation of, of what the, the dudes needed. So, I mean, definitely cut my teeth over there um, in that. Came over to, uh, left there, came to Fort Lewis, like I said, and uh, pretty good. Uh, the number of field problems, the amount of time that we were deploying, uh, those guys focused effort on trying to get me scored away, uh, it paid huge dividends. When I came to uh, to Lewis, uh, I got assigned to an infantry battalion, so they only had a single scout platoon. That was in, At that time, it was a mix of uh, infantrymen and uh, 19 Deltas made up our scout platoon. Uh, and I think that was a really good mix, particularly in an infantry battalion. Uh, having never been in an infantry battalion and always in, in cavalry squadrons, uh, there was a big difference with, uh, I guess, mindset and, and how that mission went around. We were on Humvees now instead of Bradleys. We didn't have tanks. Um, and, and so very quickly, I figured out that the vehicle uh, really was just meant to carry some water and chow. And we were we were on the ground all the damn time, um, you know, humping, doing road marches, doing all that kind of shit. Uh, the, uh, you know, but some of the guys in my platoon, because they were infantrymen at that time, they were, uh, there was a period where they were uh, going for their expert infantrymen badges. Um, and so it was kind of cool for me. I mean, I'm doing the road march with them. I'm doing all the shit that I couldn't wear an EIB. I couldn't earn an EIB because I wasn't an infantry guy. Um, but it was pretty, I, I thought it was cool that, you know, uh, I could do those tasks with those guys and then also show them how to be a scout and I guess develop them to a, to a, a different degree on a different job. And uh, it was a pretty good time, man. Um, you know, I really, man, if the second being in Germany you know, for that two years, that, that is the best group of NCOs uh, that I worked with in, in the six years that I was active duty. Um, and it's not that there weren't good NCOs in, in the other uh, units that I was in, but those guys kind of laid the foundation, I think. Um, for my mindset, what I, you know, the, the training component uh, of getting guys ready to do a task, um, leading by example, uh, trying to, you know, be knowledgeable in all the tasks and, and on all that kind of jazz. Um, I, I, it was a good foundation for me. And, and I was, like I said, I was a dipshit growing up, man. I, you know, con constantly causing trouble, um, you know, doing dumb shit. And, and so the military, I think, kind of toned me down a little bit and, and focused some of that, uh, some of that energy for me.